Welcome back to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference, empowering the good. And we're honored to be talking about The Next Door. We're joined by Mary Spencer Vesey, the Community Outreach and Events Coordinator with The Next Door. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's start with a little bit of history and context. Give us some history for The Next Door. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people get us confused with that neighborhood app, The Next Door. So we missed out on copywriting our name before they did that. Um, but a lot of times people are confused about that. So we're actually a nonprofit addiction treatment center for women. We're faith-based and we started in 2004 by First Baptist Church of Nashville. And they had this empty building and people kept saying, you know, what could we do at this building? Just going unused downtown Nashville. What could we do? And um, I thought about, you know, things that women could do, a clothing closet, some kind of book drive, things like that. But they surveyed the community and they said, that's not really the need. The need is reentry services for women coming out of prison. And they kind of said, whoa, that is not what we expected to hear. And we don't know anything about that. So they talked to a lot of different prisons in Tennessee and said, what can we do when these women get out of prison to help them kind of get reentered to society, ready to get into a job, back to their families, wherever they're going to go. And they said, I mean, the doors roll up in the middle of the night. These women get released in the middle of the night. If you can pick them up, take them to a safe spot for six months, help them get readjusted, a job, clothing, things like that, that'll change the trajectory of their lives. So they said, okay, we'll do it. We'll see what happens. And they opened the next door in 2004. They had a handful of clients come, taught them job skills, uh, life skills, how to make a resume, interviews, things like that. And they would keep women for six months. And so as time went on, it became very successful. But a lot of the women coming through our program would say, this has been super helpful, but I have a drug problem. I have an alcohol problem. And if that isn't taken care of, I'm going to be back right where I was in prison in the next three to six months. So we said, okay, how about we move our branch of reentry services to Chattanooga and in Nashville do addiction treatment? So we still do both to this day. Um, but around that time is when opioids became a hot topic. This is around 2012. And so it was the right move for us in Nashville. So we've been around for 18 years. We're still doing both of these programs and we have about 1600 clients we serve every year. That's impressive. And yeah. especially when you talk about the life transformation. So yeah. talk about duration, the process, go ahead and start unpacking how the magic works. Yeah, so for our addiction treatment program in Nashville, a woman typically will come and stay with us for 28 days. So they're coming in and they may be detoxing or they may be residential. So detox is when you're the sickest of the sick, you can't get out of bed, you just need to kind of lay and, and kind of rehabilitate. So they come and stay with us. If you're detoxing, it could be three to seven days and then you kind of enter the program. So an average day a schedule kind of looks like they're going to counseling, they go and have a group uh, therapy session, they talk with a case manager, so they're trying to figure out next steps because we never say, a lot of our clients come from homelessness, so we never say, okay, thank you for coming and going through our program, but good luck back on the street. So we always find them a place to go. When they leave us, um, we have what's called certified peer recovery specialists on staff. So these are women that have gone through our program, they're in recovery, they get it and they talk with them. They have all sorts of different groups, three meals a day. I meet with nurses, psychiatrists, pharmacists, getting all the right medications and everything they need to be healthy individuals. Um, so it's an intense process. It's a lot to fit in in 28 days. And sometimes a client leaves us and we send them to a longer program if needed. Um, but typically they say 28 days. Um, insurance is kind of dictating that more and more people go to outpatient programs. Um, it's a lot more cost effective for them. So we're kind of moving in that way too. We're doing outpatient as well. So a woman may go through our program and then they'll come back during the day and have similar treatment for three to six months. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues. And then in Chattanooga, they the women come from prison and they're actually still considered inmates. So the last six to 21 months of their sentence, they'll come and stay with us. They get a job, it's a very progressive model and they get all sorts of similar things, case management, therapy, things like that. Talk about collaboration and partnerships because mm -hmm. for what you do, partnerships are really critical to success. So talk about partnerships. 
Yeah, we have a lot of different partners in Nashville. Nashville is a hub of nonprofits. So there's a lot of us here doing a lot of different things. And we specialize in addiction treatment, but others like Thistle Farms specialize in other things. So Thistle Farms is a big partner of ours. They'll bring their clients over to us for outpatient programs or inpatient if needed. Um, in AHT, in slavery, they'll bring clients over to us once they grab those clients um, and bring them to us for any kind of detox residential treatment they may need. Um, we have a lot of women that come out of sex slavery, unfortunately, because they got addicted um, from the drugs that their drug lords would deal them to make them perform these sex acts. Um, it's really awful and you know they get addicted and it's not their fault. So we have a lot of women come in from those different partners. Um, Nashville's got so many different nonprofits. So especially these sober living houses, they're critical in Nashville because housing is already a challenge for people in Nashville and finding things that are affordable that will take people that may have criminal records, it's almost impossible. So um, we have some really great sober living partners in Nashville as well. You don't have to name names, but mm -hmm. talk about impact, share a story or stories yeah. of success. Yeah, the first one that probably comes to mind, um, I'll just call her Cameron, um, change her name. But whenever I first started, I kind of was getting to know clients. I started about two years ago and I didn't really know a lot about addiction. I didn't know how it kind of worked. And this client came to us named Cameron and she um, she had been coming out of sex, a sex slavery situation. Her father had sold her in sex slavery when she was 10 um, and she had been in it kind of ever since. And um, when she turned 16, her and a friend that were in this brothel together, they got a hold of their um, pimp's gun and said, you're going to let us go. And they got out and she was kind of on the run for years and years. But she was so addicted from the drugs that he would just pump her full of. So eventually she landed in our care after many years of kind of being on the run. And when she first got to us, she was very angry. I mean, of course you would be after everything that's happened to you that's happened to her. Um, and she just didn't know how this was going to work. She'd always been on drugs since she was a little girl. She didn't know what it was like to not feel like she was on drugs. Um, and to see the transformation of her over weeks and weeks, there were times where we were like, I don't know if she'll leave because we don't hold anybody. We don't say you have to stay. It's their choice. But um, the progression was just unbelievable. I saw her, the light come back into her eyes. And she had all this motivation to get a job and be a part of society and trust people again. She kind of lost trust with people and um, she ended up going to a sober living partner and she got a job and she worked the steps. And it was just crazy to see the transformation because I couldn't imagine going through what she went through in her childhood. And then as an adult and then coming off all these drugs, the one thing you've known your whole life and then becoming, you know, fully back, able to process everything that's happened in your life. There's a lot to process, a lot of trauma. Um, so I'm just really proud of her. It's hard. A lot of people relapse um, because that's just the nature of addiction, unfortunately. Um, but she really stuck to it and it was just unbelievable. It's heartbreaking to think that this is going on here in our own community and to think that a 10 year old sold by her father and then pumped full of drugs, mm -hmm. you know, and then has to at gunpoint try to escape. Yeah. It's heartbreaking to think that, you know, people are going through this mm -hmm. at the same time. It's hopeful to know that obviously the next door is there to help right. talk about for you personally, like it's got to change your perspective on society at the same time though. It's also got to change your hope to, to say, Hey, wait a second, we can help. We're a, we're right. a light in the darkness. So talk about kind of that side of, raising awareness for what's going on in the heartbreaking side at the same time yeah. being the beacon of light. Right. Yeah. When I started, you know, the things that I'm seeing every day at work or things you saw on TV shows, movies, that story that I just told is something that you would see on a movie. And I didn't realize that it was just in my back door, these things that are happening um, and just things that are not these women's faults. A lot of 90% of our clients experience trauma and um, a lot of their response is taking these drugs to process that trauma and not think about it at all. Um, so that's always heartbreaking and it's especially heartbreaking when we have clients relapse, but we always feel really hopeful when they come back because they know we're a safe space. So it is a lot of heartbreak and hope at the same time because we're seeing so much transformation. I have several coworkers at the next door that actually went through our program and now are on staff. So seeing them come from start to finish now they're encouraging these women that are going through the same thing they went through a couple of years ago that's really neat but it's it is hard because i mean you're hearing about it on the news more and more now especially with fentanyl on the rise 
um, kids in college are taking fentanyl not even knowing it because it's in these other drugs and they're dying. It's just, it's happening everywhere and it's not getting better. Tennessee's one of the worst states in America for overdoses. Um, so it's, it's changed my, my heart and my mind about a lot of things. I had some, some family friends that were in addiction before I came to the next door, I always kind of thought, why don't they just change and turn away from this and not take drugs? And it's not that simple. And so I'm really glad to know that because um, it's a lot easier to have compassion when you see it every day. Yeah. Carry that into how can we help? I think for many, you know, all of us are struggling, like what difference can we make? And right. you talk about how we can help through the next door and just for your personal perspective, how can the community make a difference? Yeah, I think it's really important to even not even just the next door, just in general, no matter where you are, go to an AA meeting or an NA meeting and kind of learn the lingo, kind of learn what their everyday looks like because people that are in recovery 20 years later, they're still struggling every day, not wanting to use. It's not something that you can just turn on and off like that. Um, volunteering with an addiction treatment center like ours, there's so many different needs that we personally have and other places have. We need activity volunteers. We're trying to keep them entertained and their minds busy so they're not thinking about their kids back home or their next steps. We're trying to keep it one day at a time. So getting involved with an addiction treatment center and just being a part of our community is really important. Um, as a nonprofit, we have to fundraise a lot of money because um, insurance just doesn't cover everything, unfortunately. So we have to raise $2.3 million this year. So if people want to be a part of that, um, that's a huge way. I just think it's really important to get involved and learn kind of what addiction looks like, because the odds that you know somebody in your life that's going to be affected by this disease is extremely high. It may be somebody that's really close to you and you never knew that they were going through this, that they're popping pills or whatever it is. Um, it's important just to be educated on the disease of addiction because it's going to be somewhere around you in the near future. And um, people, things happen that people don't even realize. Like I have some friends that are in real estate. People will come into those real estate um, showings and steal people's pills that are in their countertops or wherever. Um, things you just don't ever think of. And so it's important to be educated. Look for those signs. Look for it in your friends, family members, even yourself, because, you know, you having a couple of glasses of wine, turning into three, four every night. That could be a problem. And it's just good to be aware of it. Absolutely. You also have upcoming events and uh, ways to help with the fundraising. So talk about some of those. Yeah. So on September 27th, we're having a huge fundraiser at Belmont's Fisher Center. It's a new facility. Um, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year. We're expecting to have about 650 guests and hopefully raise $600,000. That's the goal. Um, so that's coming up. If people want to be a part of that, they can go to our website and buy a ticket. And then another one that's coming up is we're having a songwriter's night at the listening room. So everybody loves the listening room. It'll be great music. I think we're going to have a past client tell her story um, and just kind of talk through what it's like to be in recovery. And those tickets will go on sale in the next couple months. And you can look on the listening rooms website for those coming up soon. Talk about the songwriters night. One of my favorite parts is you hear the stories of the songs. And so yeah. you, it's almost like, you know, you, you get the inside track of what was going on in their mind. And I think it paints a whole new picture when you hear the song, then it's right. like, oh, this is the story of, you yeah. know, what's going on. And so I, I think that's to me, part of the joy of the songwriters nights, those oh, yeah. events, what, what's kind of your favorite experience for those types of events? Yeah, if you've never been to the listening room, I mean, it's an unbelievable experience because you'll go and these songwriters will get up on the stage and you'll be like, that was a Keith Urban song or that was a Justin Bieber song. And you're just kind of blown away because these people are casually sitting in their cowboy boots and, you know, their shirts that they got from, you know, Walmart or wherever. They're very, very laid back and they wrote these hit songs. And so it's really cool to hear the history behind the songs. You don't really think about that, but some of these people, I mean, their songs are really meaningful to them and these artists blow them up and their lives are changed. So it's a really neat experience. I recommend going if you've never been. Absolutely. And obviously all for a higher purpose to yes. raise funds yes. and awareness for the next door. Yeah. It's a win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so wrap up with contact information, website, yeah. social media. Where do we mm -hmm. go to learn more to get involved with the next door? Yeah. So you can go to www.thenextdoor.org. And on there, it has a link to apply to be a volunteer. It has all our event information. Um, it has tons of information. By the time this goes live, I think we'll have a new website actually up. So it'll be looking really nice. Um, but you can go there to learn more about us. 
my email and contact information. My email is so long, but it's maryspencer.vzvezey at thenextdoor.org. If you want to email me and learn more about us, come for a tour. We love showing people our facility because people think it's going to be this rundown place. It's a beautiful place. It looks like an apartment building in Midtown Nashville. It's behind a Starbucks. So it's a great, great place to come and learn more about us and our history and the women we serve every day. So make sure everyone check them out. Thenextdoor.org. Thenextdoor.org is the website. Mary Spencer VZ, Community Outreach and Events Coordinator with The Next Door. Thank you for all you and your amazing team do. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.